Hey there, and welcome back to The Fuse Show. I'm your host, David Tran, also co-founder of Xfusion.io, and I'm here joined by Craig Willis. He's a co-founder and CEO of SCORE, a process improvement tool meant for everybody. Thanks for joining us on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, David. So I have a few friends in the process improvement space, and 100% of them are absolutely passionate about that space. Can you help me explain this phenomenon and why you're so passionate about this space? <laughs> um, is it that's really interesting. So it's uh, probably worth maybe starting off talking a little bit about what process improvement sure. actually is, because I think it's it's easy to get caught by the the bug. Like once you get hooked on it, uh, you see possibilities for applying it everywhere you look, and it's that ability to really make a significant impact on somebody's business or indeed your own business by applying mm -hmm. those techniques. And I suspect that's why your friends have become so passionate about it, like so many people do. But very briefly, process improvement is a set of tools, techniques and principles that businesses of all sizes can use to uh, improve efficiency, reduce cost, uh, find opportunities for automating processes within the business, uh, demonstrate compliance with rules and regulations, improve quality, customer ex experience. You know, it really, really is wide, but ultimately it's, it's all about improving the way work happens with, within an organization. Um, and there's a huge variety of, as I say, tools and techniques out there and sometimes some of the very some of the most simple simplest available are some of the most powerful and i think mm. uh, most people who work in process improvement and indeed outside of process improvement too will be very familiar with the phrase we've always done it this way and so when you're you know when you're in any organization and you're talking to people about what they do and and how they do it you know, as an outsider, you can often be sitting there going, why on earth do they do it that way? That makes <laughs> no sense to me whatsoever. And actually, it probably makes no sense to them. But if they've never questioned it, <laughs> then, you know, they, they, they don't, they often don't challenge it. You know, you're so buried in, in the, the day to day yeah. cut and thrust of the business that you don't always question it. Um, and, and so that's what it is. And some of the tools are very complex and very comprehensive. But, you know, they can really, as I say, make a huge difference on a business. And, I, and that's why a lot of people become so passionate about it, because that ability to often go into a company, ask that one stupid question, why do you do it that way, can unlock. It's like pulling that thread that suddenly unravels the whole, you know, the whole hmm. jumper and, and, you know, you're making a significant impact on that business, maybe perhaps on their bottom line, on their customer experience or whatever it is. So how, how do tools help bring to that, bring to mind the question of like, why do we do things a certain way? Like, how do you think tools help people make better decisions and ask better questions? So if I speak very specifically about our, our tool set and what, we, what we've done with ours, again, the, 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 the overriding principles for us are around simplicity. So it's helping people take a, a very simple view very simple way of being able to look at how they work, understand what they do, but also about um, shared understanding, right? So you, very rarely does do you have in an organization one person doing one thing that doesn't touch or impact anyone else in the organization, right. right? Most work is about collaborating with people. And to do that as efficiently and effectively as possible, you have to have a, a quite a high degree of shared understanding among that team or those those people working so it's, so our perspective is all about creating that shared understanding in the simple simple simplest possible way and we do that through a, a very simple framework that actually provides a set of questions and again very very obvious questions right uh, what happens who does it and why and we just ask that over and over again, but we do it in a sort of a very simple framework. That very, very quickly, when you get a group of people together mm -hmm. and you ask that question, they very, very quickly start to see how the work happens from different perspectives. So, you know, they get to see how 
you may get two people sat next to each other on desks, been working together for years, mm -hmm. but never actually have a really clear view of what each other does. And you can hmm. get them in a room and within 20 minutes, having this conversation, using this framework, people can go, oh, that's what you do. Now I understand why you get frustrated when I do this. Hmm. Or, you know, why you take, you know, twice as long as I thought you should do to do that job, because actually you're doing something slightly different. And so just, just opening hmm. that um, not only helps people improve how they work together, but it starts to build levels of trust and, and so on. So I recognize prior to being in this role, you were a consultant for a while. Do you, when you, now that you are in the position of running this company, do you notice that companies already need to be open to discussing uh, process improvement? Or is that something that you think some, they can be convinced to adopt new practices around process improvement? Um, <laughs> well, that's, what, that's one of the fundamental challenges we deal with as a business, hmm. um, because essentially we are trying to change the way uh, a lot of process improvement specialists have been working. We're, we're trying to give them a different way of doing what they've been doing for years. And there are, a, a num you know, we meet a lot of process improvement specialists who are very good at what they do and they've been doing it for a long time and they don't have any complaints and they don't have any problems. Um, so perhaps they're not the, you know, the, the target audience for us. But there are equally a lot of businesses out there struggling to do this type of work uh, and not getting the benefits, you know, not mm -hmm. seeing those uh, situations we, that I've mentioned before that would make someone passionate about it. You know, actually finding it quite frustrating, not getting the return on the mm -hmm. investment of the time they're spending. And that's really where we have the, the most success. I think one of the things that, that makes our product different go back to this idea of simplicity uh, in terms of and, and using that to generate a, a shared understanding am among a team. Our, our product is much more accessible to a much wider audience within a business than say perhaps some of the some other process improvement tools uh, available. Now that doesn't mean that we're trying to um, say remove process improvement consultants from within businesses. But what we do is we can connect to more people within an organization. So it can actually make the job of facilitating process improvement within an organization much easier uh, and allow businesses to do that at a much bigger scale. Uh, and not hmm. just scaling it, but also making it a bit more su sustainable. Uh, a, a great story I heard from an insurance company, this is not an uncommon story, uh, but talking to a process improvement team at an insurance company, and they said, essentially, um, we, we have this phrase in the UK, and I, I've, I've, I've always wondered whether this is, same, this is similar with the Golden Gate Bridge, but there's a bridge called the Fourth Bridge in the UK. And there's a team of painters that paint the bridge, and it takes them 12 months to paint the whole bridge from one end to the other. And once they finish, they go back to the, the beginning and they start all over again. And it's a continuous job. This continuous hmm. improvement team and this insurance company said it, it, they were saying exactly the same thing. What they do is they facilitate teams and enable them to perform process improvement on themselves. So they show them the tools, they give them the tools, they train them up, and then they go to the next team and do the same thing. And, uh, and after about 12 months, they actually go back to the first team. And in that time, the team haven't they, they, they haven't used the tools for, say, 10 months. They've forgotten the techniques and you know what a third of the team has churned or they've you know moved on to other teams so they have to start again and really <laughs> what we're trying to do is kind of hey, say hey this, this is madness like you you, you want to be con continually improving on that so we're trying to make those tools more accessible to to those end teams if you like within the business so when you were first starting at score how did you how do you know what features you want to build into the platform and how do you find your first customers? The, the, we started with a very simple idea, which was that we wanted to build, we wanted to build something where we could map a process at the speed of conversation. Okay. So we, we had, we had experience of both running, um, of, 
essentially as a consultant, a large portion of our work was running workshops. So it was getting groups of people together and getting them to talk and describe their processes, uh, maybe talk about some of the pain points they had, maybe even go on and talk about uh, opportunities for, for improving it. And there's various ways you can actually capture that information. And we had a lot of experience of using software tools to do that. Uh, and experience of doing that with you know whiteboards and and sticky notes and 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 pens, and they both have their sort of pros and cons, but ultimately, the 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 whiteboard experience was good in terms of being quite interactive and engaging, but it was a little bit slow and cumbersome, and also at the end of it, you essentially had to get your cell. You know, take a picture of the board, then somebody goes away, spends hours right. or days writing that up. And then, I don't know, you, you're there with your cell, you're just trying to zoom into the picture again. What is that actually? What was written there? Well, you've got the paper folded up in the, in the back and, <laughs> and all of those sort of things. And we said, hey, like there must be a way to do to get the best of both worlds, right? To, to have the workshop still be kind of engaging, um, interactive, you know, you're trying to get that flow of consciousness, people talking about what they work, uh, about how they work, um, but but capture it into a system at, at the same time. So, you know, we took this very simple framework. I talked about the what happens, who does it, and why do they do it? And we built a very simple interface that allowed us to basically throw boxes onto the, onto the page, connect the lines together, and... You know, we, we sat down and spent a long time saying, you know, how do we just, just build that and nothing else? And mm -hmm. fortunately, being consultants at the time meant that um, you know, once we had something that kind of technically worked, we could go out and use it and, and, and test it. So I suppose that's what a lot of people might call the minimum viable product, right? It was something very, very basic, but it, it, it allowed us to go out and test it and prove prove that concept. Um, and of course, once we started using it, people saw it straight away because we're using it in, in workshops and we very quickly started to get questions about, okay, so what's the output of this? I'm like, hey, hey we haven't thought of that bit yet. <laughs> like, <laughs> what I do is I take a screenshot of my Mac and, mm. and embed it into a document. But, you know, we started mm. getting those questions and, it, you know, it, it started to grow from there. So it was, do you, do you remember the story of the first, the customer number one? Uh, it, that's one of those, uh, that's one of those questions. Like how, how do you define, how do you define the customer? But actually the, the first, um, business that paid us, uh, and it, this was still our, what we'd consider the minimum viable product. We, we actually, um, licensed it and sold it. So that first hmm. customer that bought from us, um, are, are still, still one of our best hmm. customers, um, but it, it was actually a consultant I met on a previous consulting gig. We were doing some work together. We did, um, we did a series of these workshops as part of this program. And when that program finished, it was about three months after that program finished, he got in contact and said, I, I need that tool. I need it for my next project. And, and I was like, okay, I'm not sure how we're going to do this. So we sat down, we worked out how to package it up. We created a company because we didn't even have a company at the time. <laughs> we opened a bank account and we, and we set it up and we sold one license. And I think we sold the first hmm. license for like a hundred bucks. But it, you know, it was that moment in time when it sort of went, okay, so we know it works because we've tested it. Now we've got people coming and, and want, you know, willing to pay us money to, and the product hmm. was a desktop product at that time, by the way, like we hadn't even moved to the cloud. Um, but but someone was willing to click a button, download, install onto their laptop, and uh, pay us money for it. So that was a big boost. So what was the point when you when you realized once it's monetizable that you want to like double down and continue the growth of Score versus focusing on consulting yourself and just using the tool to make yourself more efficient? So I think that that's kind of one of the things that was that's probably been one of the hardest things. Hmm. in the journey so far for us because we, we're consultants. So that, there's three co-founders of the business and we're all consultants at heart. We love the consulting work. 
Uh, we love getting into a diverse range of businesses and really sort of understanding the challenges they face and you know, all of those things we talked about with process improvement about being able to make both short-term immediate impacts improve people's lives and long-term uh, improvements to the business and we I, it probably took us three years i guess three to four years of trying to one minute we were like we're a software business we're going to build a software business we're going to sell sell software licenses and the next minute it's like hey there's this great project over here you know with this <laughs> great you know well-known food manufacturer and they've got this really thorny problem and the next thing is six months and we were kind of swallowed up in that that project and um yeah it, it i i would say um even up to the beginning of the pandemic, we were still delivering a significant amount of consulting work to support our license sales. I see. And the business has actually now completely changed, and it is it's a hundred percent license sales now. Uh, but it, you know, although it gone right down it was still a kind of it was just so hard to let go of and we were almost essentially because of the lockdowns and the, the pandemic we were forced to let go of it and i you know it was a positive mm. um for the business can you elaborate on that you said that the pandemic forced you to go in the direction of pure product versus product plus service did i hear you right yeah so we we had prior to the pandemic and probably six months we had as a team had made the decision we wanted to focus purely on the software so like mentally we'd made that decision but it it, it was we we bootstrapped the business up until july this year we bootstrapped our business mm -hmm. so far and so there's a kind of there's a, like a badge of honor if, from, from having done that yeah we you know, the, the business has been profitable almost every year since we went since we commercialized it um, but that, again, that profitability was driven largely by services and consulting revenue. Okay. Yeah. And so you, you've got this situation where the um, license revenue is growing, but it's not yet growing enough to make up for the services revenue. And part of the reason that it's not growing fast enough is because we as founders are not spending enough time working on the business and growing the business because we're charging our time out on consulting consulting yeah yeah and and it, so it we had a plan and it was gradually tipping in the way we wanted to to move it but it was a you know it was a slow process and when the pandemic hit a, a lot of our licensed sales at that point were had a significant services component to them and of course with the lockdown being enforced certainly here in the UK a lot of those businesses were like, right, we're pulling funding, we're putting projects on, on pause. And so at that point, it was like, okay, there is no services revenue out there or very, very little. So now as a team, we've got time to, to focus on uh, building up the license revenue. And I think, you know, that there was an interesting thing happen. If I go back to the 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 technique of of using like whiteboards and sticky notes to capture this type of information like that's been the default of way of doing it for years and you know, in, in, you know up to early 2020 we would talk to a lot of people and say hey we have built this great tool that kind of allows you to sort of like almost automate some of that stuff right you're taking away you can take away the whiteboard you can do it straight in people are like nope I, white, the whiteboard works for me and i'm going to keep doing it suddenly they weren't allowed to be in the room together anymore they had to do yeah. it online and that forced a lot of people to go out and look at other other products right that could do this sort yeah. of thing, working with teams and zoom and so on um, and so we saw a lot of people come to us and, and, you know, through that, they wanted a tool they could use online to do this type of work. How do people discover you if you don't, if they don't have a personal connection to you or your company? Like what do they have to Google to find your company? Uh, so again, that's something that's kind of, uh, changed over time. Um, we, if we invest in marketing so we see this as you know very much a marketing-led organization um the 
most of our growth in the last 12 months has come through our self-service business. So that's often, you know, in individuals, individual analysts, consultants coming onto our website and take and, and signing up. Mm. So, you know, you can imagine that we very quickly exhausted our network trying to generate that type of sign up and, and growth. Um, so, it, you know, it's really been a, an investment in ad, online advertising, um, social media. We, we, we've got to a point where um, certainly two of the founders in the business are LinkedIn profiles are sort of self-generating traffic, you know, so we get regular connections hmm. coming through. Um, yeah, I, I, we run events, we attend events, um, but it's hard, right? <laughs> it's trying to, trying to crack marketing is, a, is tough. Something I appreciate about the way that you speak is that you use like the terms we and the team a lot, uh, as opposed to like I or myself. Uh, and I, I, I believe you use that term because it's, you, you view it as like a team contribution. Who, who, who was the team? How big was the team throughout its like earlier years? Uh, we started, so mentioned the three founders, um, and certainly in the early stages of the business, we didn't have all of the technical development skills. So we've, we've used a number of agencies over the years to sort of help build aspects of the product. But 20, 2018 was when we, we first started building the team. So the team's up to about 10, 10 of us in the team at the moment. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's been relatively static in the last, the size has been relatively static. Uh, we've had a, a couple of junior members of staff who joined us, you know, straight out of, um, out of university have, you know, uh, moved on to other projects and then we've hired some new staff and we, we're going through a growth phase at the moment. So we're, you know, we're looking to fill a couple of roles in the in the business at the moment but it's a great team hmm. we have brought people on more we've made the hiring decisions more on their fit in the team than uh you know necessarily the a specific skill set that we're looking for so we, we're looking for a skill set we'll interview a bunch of people but we might choose someone who maybe doesn't quite have the experience uh, or maybe not have a, an air, a specific piece of expertise in a specific area, but they they seem to have a better sort of cultural fit with the rest of us. We think that's really important. What was the, um, I guess, have you have you been operating that way long enough to figure out if it's like something that works out for you and your team? Sorry, uh, say the question again? Sure. Uh -huh. um, the philosophy of hiring based on fit versus experience, how'd that pan out over time? Uh, it works really well at the moment because mm -hmm. as you can imagine in a in a startup you're like everyone wears multiple hats and i think you know if you you need people who are going to be dynamic you know who are prepared to do things that they might not have necessarily trained for um you know roll their sleeves up and get involved in in different things um, so right now, this, it works really well for us because of the size of the team. I think as as we scale up, then we you know we'll we will start having to look at more specialisms in in different areas to to really accelerate. Uh, but the other thing I think is is interesting about this approach is how it brings innovation to the to the group because. Hmm. Uh, I, Actually, a, a great example today, we had a product meeting today about some new features coming in um, that are currently under development. And it's like we've got to the point where they, the sort of core of the features are, are, are sort of technically working, but we're now sort of thinking about, okay, how do we present them? Where about in the app do they fit? How, you know, What language do we use? And we actually brought the whole team together and sat down and so we've you know we've got the the marketing team we've got the sales team customer success as well as the technical team where we all sit together and sort of talk through and you know the the other members of the team ask some great questions and say things brilliant things like i've got no idea what that means 
<laughs> and you're like, oh, well, if you don't understand what that means, good chance there's a, you know, there's a, a, a lot of other people who won't understand. So we need to work out a way to do it. And sometimes they come up with ideas. It's like, why don't you do this? You know, and your almost your initial reaction is, well, why would you do that? And then you go, actually, that's really interesting <laughs> insight <laughs> that, that we, you know. Can you give an example? Example. Um, what, I'm trying to think of one of the ones that something that that came up today. He put me on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, the, 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 so one of the ones that came up was, um, I talk about this idea of um, you sort of mapping processes and analyzing processes at the speed of conversation. And the one of the ways we do that is we've built a set of quite simple shortcuts into the product. So we've got this sort of framework that these shortcuts that allow you to basically, yeah, as you're talking or in the middle of the discussion, you can use these shortcuts to throw the ideas up onto the page. And one of the shapes that we use to do this didn't have a shortcut on it. Hmm. Now, it kind of never really occurred to us, but someone in the room went, so you, you've you got a shortcut that does X, you've got a shortcut that does Y, but why don't you have a shortcut that does Z? <laughs> and it was like, you know, the, again, the initial reaction was, well, I, I've never used that, so why would I do it? And then it was like, <laughs> well, actually, the, you can see the thought process and logically yeah. it makes sense to do that. Um, hmm. And that's a very small example, but it's that idea of, you know, bringing different people together with different experiences and um, asking their thoughts and opinions. Earlier, you were mentioning cultural fit when it comes to hiring. What is what is a sign that someone is a good cultural fit? Like, what are your cultural values and norms that uh, help you define that process of hiring? So people have to be, in our team, people have to be um, approachable, uh, open. Um, you know, we, it, we as a team look at, okay, what are the customers that really work, that we work well with? So what are the customers that have got real huge amounts of value from our product? Um, and what is it about them that we really like? And, and actually one of the, one of the things we realized was that those customers that come to us right from the very early stage, whether it's trial or even pre-trial mm -hmm. and want to engage with us and want to talk to us and be very open, um, generally are those ones that turn into those, those great customers that, that, that hmm. we can grow um, and help really help them drive value from the product. So you know, that we, so why does that, why is that the case? And actually as founders, we're, we're like that. We want to be accessible. We want people to feel they can come and talk to us. We want to be very open. So again, when we're bringing people into the business, they have to be the same, right? We want everybody to be like that so that the customers feel mm. that they, that, that, that we're um, accessible. And I think the other thing we really like, and this is again, part of the fact that being a small team and being very dynamic is that we want people to be naturally curious, like about, you know, about everything. Um, because curiosity is essentially one of the kind of early steps to learning right? mm -hmm. and you know someone who's constantly learning and developing is going to is again going to drive innovation it's going to help us grow the business it's going to help us move a, a step forward so we look for that curiosity again if you're you know in an interview situation you very quickly get a feel for like how many questions are they asking you and you know, if they've really gone and done their homework on the business, yeah, I think mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but um, you, know, I, we've interviewed an awful lot of people who've never even looked at our website before coming to the interview, and it's like, <laughs> do you really want this? <laughs> yeah, do you mm -hmm. really want the position? But someone who's kind of kind of gone beyond that and done some research and then asked some really kind of pointed and often challenging questions. Uh, again, sort of starts to demonstrate that, that curiosity. So those are two of the key values we we look for. Hmm. And when you're doing these, are you are you the one that does all the interviews, or do you split it based on domain within your monster co-founders? Uh, it, it it depends on the area of of the business. Okay. We we try to um, so typically one person will take the lead. So you know our marketing manager has hired people into her team. 
Um, the but what we try to do is if one of the founders isn't involved in that initial interview, then we'll try and bring one in for a second interview. Normally, by that point, we've made a decision though for the hmm. from the hire. So we, it's you know it's not like we don't want ev everyone involved in anything or even one person, right? Because like I, if it was just me doing all the hiring, I'd end up hiring lots of people who are exactly the same. So you know, having different members of the team do the hiring gives some, you know di more diversity. How large is the team today? So it's, we're still at ten. Uh, as I said, we've had a, a, this summer. We've had a bit of change of the team, so we've had two go, two come in, uh, but we're we're in the growth phase at the moment. So we're looking to fill a couple more positions before Christmas. Uh, yeah, and then possibly more in the new year. What does growth phase mean to you? Uh, like what's on the roadmap? Uh, so the the biggest things on the roadmap at the moment, um, we we are coming to the later stages of the next major release of the product. So that's a super exciting time um, for the business. You know, we're seeing. You know, I mentioned before about the, the the new features that we were looking at today. You know, the the development team are getting increasingly excited because they're, you know, a lot of what they're now showing us on a weekly basis is is it's no longer kind of code and architectural diagrams. It's real user interfaces doing real things. You know, so that's that's super exciting. Um, that's you know going to bring a whole new level of um, usability, uh, analysis capabilities, even some of the process management tools that we provide, um, you know, really getting a supercharge in this next release. There's a big long list of things in there that existing clients are really excited about, been asking for. So that's a, that's a big, that's a big piece. I think the, um, there's a, 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 big piece of creative effort that we've been putting into the business. So again, part of the areas we've been investing in in the last few months um, is that sort of cr creative area, looking at not just how we present the company, but actually the product as well. So again, the, you know, the early um, feedback we're getting on that is, you know, the product itself just looks kind of um, really, really nice from a, you know, that first mm. impression point of view. And hey, hey, it looks great today, but again, sort of taking it to, to the next level. Um, but the other, the other thing that, that, that we're really ramping up on at the moment is, uh, you know, again, marketing is continuing to grow. So we, we're seeing high levels of predictable growth for new, um, new leads and trial signups coming in. And of course, we're also putting a lot of effort into how we scale those onboarding hmm. processes up as people come in, uh, new new customers come in through the door. I imagine it's actually pretty heavy because if someone's never worked with a process improvement tool before, there's like a pretty steep learning curve. Or is it? Are you trying to make it as simple as possible? Uh, so our goal is all about making it as simple as possible. Okay. Um, now that's not to say there isn't a learning curve. There's there's a really interesting point. So we we often get a lot of experience process Im improvement uh, consultants or practitioners come along, and they will look at the tool. And as long as we're very clear about what the tool does and how it's different from what else is on there in the market, they can make a very quick decision about yes, this is something I can see value in and will help me, or or no, it doesn't. I think that was an important thing to do for us hmm. to learn, certainly um, in the past 12 months, is to be very upfront about the differentiators because that uh, that that takes a lot of lot of wasted time away. So those that type of audience tends to pick up the product, they get it, they already know all the principles behind process improvement, they can just run with it. Hmm. But in that sort of less experienced space, we get this really interesting mix of people come where we get some that they can pick it up, they can log in, you know, they'll, they'll take a trial and then they'll email our customer success team and they'll go, this is the most amazing thing I've, you know, I've, I've used in years. Like, how did you make this so simple to, to get it? And then there's others that will come back and say, I've been looking at this for several days now and I don't think I'm doing it the right way. Can, can you, you help me? Um, but our training is, you know, our education is all online. Yeah. It's, it's self, 
paste you know their short five minute modules that say hey have you thought about doing this have you thought about this structure the biggest challenge really is not so much using the product and picking up the tools and techniques it's knowing where to start hmm. um, and whether that's uh you know um, an individual within a business who is taking the lead in trying to deliver process improvement. So let's say it's like a quality manager in a business or it's a business analyst. It, it, it's trying to, or it's trying to find what is that first process that I'm going to look at that's going to make a real difference to, to a business or demonstrate the value that this can bring. Even business owners struggle with this. Uh, and, and, it's actually not that difficult to help them get there. And this is one of the things, our, again, our customer success team providers, we've got a set of very simple templates that we provide mm. to the customers. And it just, it's, it essentially allows you to very, very quickly hone on what is the one or two processes in my business today that are, that are causing me the most pain, but actually I could fix very, very quickly using this technique. Mm. Okay. I recognize that you've been at your company for a lot longer than a lot of other, or actually your company's been alive a lot longer than a lot of the other companies I've interviewed on this show. What makes you, uh, so what gives you joy in the position of being a CEO and how has that role changed over the years? <laughs> the, yeah, the, the company, if you go back to the earlier story about the, the sort of first client, the early days of trying to build up, minimum viable product, the, the, the sort of big, long process of trying to decide whether we were a consulting company with a unique tool set or we're actually a software company selling um, a software improvement platform. That itself has been, you know, quite, quite a journey. And actually one of the, the things that, um, things that we perhaps could have done better early on was um we the role of ceo we didn't we actually didn't have this is the three mm. founders we sort of saw ourselves as equal what well, we did we saw ourselves as equal in the business and it was just a case of we've got to get stuff done we're not going to worry about job titles we're just going to kind of do what we needs to be done and we'll see where our skill sets naturally fall as it happened one of the team had an aptitude for the more technical aspects of software development. One had uh, an, an aptitude for, more for sales and one for marketing and, and that sort of thing. So we sort of naturally fell into that. But as soon as we started to bring on, grow the team, it became apparent very, very quickly that it was without a proper structure, it, it wasn't clear. And so that's hmm. where I, you know, where, the team said, hey, we need someone to take the lead, make the key decisions, um, you know, take the lead on fundraising, that that sort of thing. And, you know, it was a very quick discussion. And I said, hey, you know, Craig, we think you're the, you know, we, you need to take that role. What are some of the traits that you think you exhibit that makes you the, the appropriate choice? Like, why do you think your teammates chose you? Like, what are some traits that you think CEOs should have in general? <laughs> <The th> <laughs> I, I'm laughing because I, I, I don't know if there's like a, a good answer okay. to that. <laughs> I don't know if there's like a single answer to that. I, th I think what in our particular situation, and there's a couple of things that spring to mind. I've always been a generalist. Like I've never really had a... Um, Throughout my career, I've never had a specialization. I'll give you an example. I actually left school very young. Um, I spent some time working in the construction industry and went into manufacturing. I actually found my way into electronics engineering. Um, did that for several years. So this is hardware manufacturing and electronics. Uh, through that, I got involved in software development, so that was really interesting. I then moved into network engineering. Uh, I then decided to go back to education, went to university and studied politics. I left university and went into um, software training. 
and then I became a consultant. And so, so you know, white background. Yeah, and so um, I had all of these sort of different experience, and uh, you know. I think that's really important because you really start to get to see these kind of different perspectives uh, and different views. I think the other thing that, uh, in again, the, whether it's unique to my situation or not, I, I don't know, but one of the things that I'm quite good at with this team is having an idea in terms of uh, some sort of direction or a vision that we want to go in. And then rather than you know sitting down and saying to the team, this is the direction we're going to go in, uh, I, I've always liked to take the time to sort of go and have conversations with each member of the team about, okay, I think, you know, what do you think about this particular challenge? How do you think we'd overcome it? And start planting the seeds. And so what happens is the team kind of start to all come together with the same view. And we then get in a room together and say, okay, how are we going to do this? And everyone's going, we're going to do it this way. <laughs> And so that's a skill that I think I, you know, I've, hmm. I've developed over the years that um, you bring helps bring the team together. And when we do that, it helps us make a step, a good, a big step forward. So the last question I'd like to ask you is, what's something you've learned in the past few years that you wish you learned like five years ago? Wow, there's so many things. <laughs> I look back, there's things I do on a a daily basis i learn things and go oh, why didn't i do that a long time ago i think I'm, <laughs> i think i'm also reaching that age where you sort of you know a lot of things over time start to um you, 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 things you've seen over the years they sort of start to form in an idea where you go oh actually if i'd done that in a different way that would have probably happened quicker hmm. and so on I think, though, the, the one thing that stands out in my mind at the moment has been one of the biggest lessons we've learned it's probably this the last 12 months is actually what I talked about a little bit before, where we sat down and started to think about what is an, what is an ideal type of customer that we want to work with and not just, all right, who's bringing in the most which customer brings in the most revenue, right? Who's right. paying us the most money, but actually um, those ones that, that, that are like us to, to, you know, talking about that, you know, that openness, that willingness to talk and engage because that, you know, all the things I talked about before, it means that we we're able to really help them get the most value out of the product. But it also really helps us understand where they are on the journey. So it's great because we're helping them get more value out of the product. Uh, but it's also helping us forecasting, for example, because mm -hmm. we know very early on if there's something that's not working for the client and we can fix it. You know, so in a SaaS business where you're you know you're building your business based on recurring revenue. You, you've got a much higher degree of confidence in renewals around those clients than ones that you, you never speak to. So that was really important, but it was like looking at that and actually then saying, okay, now that we know that about our existing clients, how do we take that into companies that aren't clients yet? And so starting to build that into our uh, sales and marketing, again, starts to give us that, that more visibility. So, Again, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but you know, if we if someone engages with us, even you know, at the beginning of a trial or a pre-trial, that's a really good sign that you know there's, hmm. and so that helps us again. It, it becomes one of the markers we use for um, you, you're forecasting what's coming, both in terms of uh, existing customers and um, new customers. And building that into the marketing materials means, you know, we can try to attract those types, you know, really focus on trying to attract those types of customers. What's the percentage of your features or feature requests? Or sorry, what's the percentage of features that came from requests from these sorts of conversations? So I, I would say that like I could, not, could I put a percentage on it? Uh, I don't know. 
I would say part, part. Yeah, I would say a vast majority, right? I'd say okay. eighty to ninety percent. But it's not hmm. like it's not a case of it's not a one to one relationship. Right, 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 right. It's not the client coming, I need a button to do X and we go, Okay, yeah, we'll put that on the on the development schedule and you know, next week it's there. Going back to that whole idea of engaging and being open and, and talking to the clients, it's the client comes to us and says be great if you had a button that did X, and we go, okay. What was? Why do you need the button to do X? What brought you to that point? And in the, we go into a much more collaborative um, process where we'd look at that, and hmm. then actually go and talk to other clients, and and you know, really kind of get under the surface of that challenge, and then come back to the team. We've got a great network of uh, partners as well, so these tend to be consulting companies who are going out and doing this on multiple organisations. So we'll go and talk to them, get their feedback. So it, it, it becomes something like that. It's like, where does this fit within the whole puzzle of, of score? And how does it hmm. add value to the, to the overall picture? And I think virtually everything we develop comes that way. It's um, with the exception, I suppose, of some very, very technical, often security related features yeah. that the you know that the i team or infosec come up with going look we need this like you have to <laughs> your tokens have to be formatted in this way or something mm. like that that it you know that. okay well i've enjoyed this past hour craig thanks for your insights and i've enjoyed yeah just talking to you about this new space i haven't really heard a lot about prior uh, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you before we end this call i just wanted to give you an opportunity for our guests and anyone who watches this video, how can they follow you along your journey and follow your company along? Well, the, we're most active on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so I welcome connections from anybody in the process improvement space or indeed even in the, in the, in the startup space. Um, we see a lot of organizations using our product, not just for documenting and analyzing and improving existing processes but actually also exploring new ways of doing things like if you're hmm. looking at a new way of onboarding clients or a new way of going out and finding new business sometimes just sitting around and and throwing you know exploring these processes through scores is, is very enlightening so that's something that we're quite passionate about we're really open to talking to people about that um my profile on linkedin i'm craig j willis on LinkedIn should be fairly easy to find. We run a bi-monthly event, which we school, which we call Scrum with a K. So that's S K R U M. Um, and the next one is coming up uh, in September this year. Uh, they're open to anyone. Again, September this year being this month. Uh, th yes, sorry, uh, September. Okay. So this month, later this month. <laughs> the the exact date escapes me off the top of my head. Um, but, so we're active on LinkedIn all the time. So by all means, come follow the company page, uh, connect with me, or you can find our website. It's getscore, so G-E-T-S-K-O-R-E dot com. Um, you know, we're, we're active bloggers on there. Obviously, you can take a free trial. Um, but yeah, we'd love to, to connect with people whether they want to um, look at a trial or not. Sounds good. Thanks again, Craig. Thank you.